Hi everyone, <coughs> thank you for coming. My name is Cristina Vázquez, I'm the president of ECUSA Boston and co-founder of this chapter together with Isabel Dominguez and Luis Olmos is the vice president of ECUSA Boston. We and the rest of the team of ECUSA Boston are very pleased to have all of you here tonight celebrating our first anniversary. And for this special event, we have a very special <coughs> guest, Marcel Valtels. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. We also have to thank our sponsors, Fundación Ramón Areces, the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology, FETIT, and MIT Spain. And here we would like to mention Alicia Goldstein for helping us with all the logistics. I would like to start talking about our mission. In ECUSA, we want to promote the role of science and technology developed by professionals, Spanish professionals in the US. And we call this ECUSA Science Outreach. We also want to expand the career opportunities of these professionals in the US. And we know this as Professional Development and Networking, or PDM. In ECUSA, we also want to educate and inspire the future generations. And this is ECUSA Education. Tonight, we will talk about the projects that we have developed in these three different areas. Last year, we did an experiment that we would like to repeat here tonight in this room. So who in this room works in science? And it can be biomedicine, maths, physics, social science. Please uh, raise your hand. OK. Thanks. What about technology? Any engineers in the room? Great. Communication in science and technology? <laughs> Education in any of these areas? Administration? Who has an interest in science and technology, even if you don't work here? Excellent, thank you. <laughs> All of you are more than welcome to join ECUSA, and we really hope you do it after tonight if you haven't done it so far. Since we launched ECUSA a year and a half ago, we have grown very rapidly. Today, we are over 600 associate members distributed in more than 30 states in the US. We have five different chapters. ECUSA Boston, which was the first one, and this was followed by ECUSA New York, DC, California, and this month we are launching ECUSA Midwest. Last month we launched a new concept of membership called Full Members. This is for those of you who want to further contribute to ECUSA's projects by donating $30 a year. These Full Members will be able to benefit from multiple advantages such as discounts and priority in our programs and events, and also discounts in, term, in terms of immigration, as we will talk later. If you want to become a member, you just have to go to this uh, website, and we will send you an email after this email, this event, to make it even easier. Before we talk about the projects that we have developed this year, I would like to introduce you to the fantastic, terrific, terrific, awesome team that we have in ECUSA Boston that has made all these projects possible in collaboration with all the other chapters. As a co-founder and uh, the National Director of Professional Development and Networking, we have Isabel Dominguez. Luis Olmos is the Vice President and he's also the National Director of Fundraising and collaborates with the education projects and communication. Francisco Martín is our secretary, and he works in community. Carlos Romero is our treasurer and works in fundraising. In our communication team, we have Chari Fernández and Javier Pérez Barbuzano. Chari is in charge of the blog, and Javier writes the newsletter that you receive every 15 days in your email, together with uh, Luis Olmos. In the IT team, we have Daniel Navarro, who takes care of our website, and Abel Suárez and Jorge Onieva, who are leading the Experts Guide program. We will talk about this later. In networking, we have Joaquin López, who is the director of Ciencia y Un Jamón. Our national director of education is 
Rebecca Salguero. And in events and programs, we have Jose Ruperez, who just joined our team, and Maria Soriano and Marta Murcia, who organize the science seminars, and Stivalit Arcel, who is collaborating with the mentoring program of Fostering Talks <coughs> together with uh, the other chapters. In the next few slides, we will talk about the achievements that we have fulfilled during this first year in science outreach, education, and professional development and networking. Let's start by science outreach. During these first years, we have organized multiple seminars, led by Marta Murcia, Maria Soriano, myself, and the rest of the team. We had our first event a year ago, launched by Jose Ignacio Fernandez Vera, the director of FECID. And in this event, we could, we could enjoy a very interesting panel with Belén Carrillo, Isabel Dominguez, Rocío López, and Israel Ruiz. At the beginning of this year, Gonzalo Giribet came to talk about evolution. Rafael Luna gave a seminar on scientific storytelling. We could learn some tips about how to do networking in the US from Lawrence Solano. Ricardo Garcia talked about the Ritchie Foundation for Childhood Cancer. And Mariana Castells gave a very interesting seminar on allergy to foods and medications. Our next and last seminar for this year will take place on December 10th at the Real Colegio Complutense with Tomás Palacios. He will talk about nanomaterials and how to develop new electronic devices. So please save the day. Luis Olmos is going to take it from here to talk about education. Thank you, Christina. Uh, good evening, everybody. So let's keep talking about our achievements for this year. Um, Ecusa Educa. So Ecusa Educa is a global educational program that has been founded by Rebecca Salguero and myself that aligns very well with Ecusa mission to educate, inspire, and train the new generations of scientists and innovators. And importantly, we do it that by benefiting the community. So Ecusa also gives to the community. So we have one program that is Ecusa en las Escuelas, Ecusa Among Schools, that aims to promote STEM areas in K kindergarten to eighth grader schools in the Boston, bilingual Boston schools. So the target are these kids here in the front row. Um, <clears throat> we do that by bringing to the schools professional members of Ecusa and teaching in Spanish. So we teach science, and at the same time, we are promoting our language and culture. I would like to thank Isabel Calvo, Marina Gago, and all the members, uh, such as uh, Laura Contreras, Manuel Cabello, and uh, Ana Luisa de Sosa. They began last year this program for the commitment and involvement. We do have another program called Ecusa Entre Culturas, Ecusa Among Cultures, which aims to connect schools from kindergarten to eighth grade from Spain and from the United States to develop a scientific project together. It is what is called like project-based learning and basically it's the idea to focusing on learning by doing and also we are doing in a cross-cultural setting. So we are launching a um, pilot program hopefully in the next month or so. I would like to thank also Maria Duenas who just joined the team for this program. Ciencia y un jamón. Of course, I think we all know how important networking it is. And Ecusa Boston is aware of that. And uh, Joaquin Lopez has taken the lead in organizing these events of Ciencia y Jamón, Science and Ham, where we just meet and talk to people at bars. It's our social program. Um, we do have raffles as well, so the winner gets uh, Ham, thank you to our collaborator, Jamón Iberto. So here you can see photos of a previous event, and here is Joaquin Lopez giving the, the prize to our last winner, Jose Perez. There's only one caveat, that this prize is only for full members, so you already have a good reason to become a full member. Well, professional development is at the core of the Cusa Boston. We are committed to provide substantial benefits to our members, to promote their professional careers. And this is an example. 
This is a CUSA expert guide. It's a, a document that has been elaborated by Jorge Onieva, Javier Pérez Bacuzano, and Andrés Suárez that contains the names and the field of expertise of the members and aims to be a reference guide for mass media, industry, government, institutions that may contact at any time these our members if they are seeking, for example, expert opinions in a particular matter. So we think that we are enhancing their professional networking as well as we are enhancing their professional visibility. We also do workshops, career-related. And here is a photo of an example where we organize a workshop to find about finding a job in the United States. This in particular was um, presented by, taught by Nicole Anderson, Assistant Director of the Korean Centers in Dutch University, and Lauren Solano, the CEO of the Careers. Isabel Dominguez is the one leading this very important program for us. We also, in Nebusa Boston, but in Nebusa, are establishing collaborations with the Spanish universities to disseminate the Nebusa Association. And we also, we want to let them know that to the university community that we are here to embrace all the students who to continue their professional careers here in the United States. So here is a photo of a webinar that was given to the University of Murcia, and it was uh, done by Isabel Dominguez and Cristina Valle. We are also interested in establishing local agreements here in the Boston area to help and promote the association. And this is the case with the Rich Foundation and its founder, Ricardo Garcia, as you can see it over here, who is the leading of their cause, which is fighting against cancer in children. So we have a framework agreement with them and have been followed by specific agreements such as Richie Talents. It's a program they have developed to search and promote talents in the high schools in Spain. And also this year, we are we have achieved in ECUSA a new sponsor for a national, and it's Picolo. So Picolo is a Boston-based firm that practices in the areas of immigration and real estate. Uh, here you can see Javier Pico, who is today here present. And Carlos Romero, who is the one that made it possible to reach this agreement. Thank you, Carlos. So we have an upcoming business seminar for international professionals. And we will keep you informed. Um, thank you. And Chris, Isabel Dominguez will continue from here. Thank you, Luis. Thanks very much. As a co-founder of Ecusa Boston, I'm really proud of having a team that has worked tirelessly to bring to you all of, this, all of these different events that we have uh, seen today. And I would like you to join me in thanking them with, uh, with an applause. <laughs> the accomplishments of ECUSA go beyond what we do here at ECUSA Boston. At the national level, we have also a number of accomplishments that we are very proud of. And if you are interested, you can download our annual review that is on our website. And it lists everything that we have done in ECUSA in the past year. I would like to highlight two of the accomplishments that I'm, I think uh, are very important for us. The first one is the first meeting of the Spanish scientists in the USA that took place at Georgetown University in September of this year. This meeting uh, was, uh, was uh, organized together with the, with the Cathedra Principe de Asturias from Georgetown University, with the Federation of Science and Technology, and also with the Spanish Embassy. This meeting was a terrific success because it brought together scientists, communicators, sociologists, and also the institutions in Spain. And we had really important in, in, uh, conversations and talks and discussions about science, the future of science in Spain and the US, how to better communications for scientists, and how to promote change in society. This meeting was, so, was also important because it counted with the support of their majesties, King Philip VI and Leticia, that reiterated their commitment to science and to Spanish professionals, both in Spain and outside Spain. 
Frank, Fran and I were really privileged to participate in the organization of this meeting. And it's a meeting that we would like to continue in the years ahead. So watch out for our news, for, for our uh, newsletter to see when it's coming up. The second I would like to highlight the creation of the Professional Development and Networking Commission. This is a commission that I lead at the national level. We at PDN have a mission to strengthen and advocate for your careers here in the US and outside the US, and also to promote the new generations of scientists that are coming out of Spain. And for these, we have a very ambitious uh, strategic plan that comes all the way from welcoming you to the US, all the way to advocacy for you to find an employment, going through networking and mentorship. Out of everything that we are doing, we, I like to highlight two uh, different um, programs that are coming or will be coming soon in the next year. One of them is the Welcome Packet that is being led by a, by a team from New York City. The Welcome Packet is a set of, I guess, instructions that will help all of us to adapt to society here in the United States. Uh, that is something that I think is important for us not to be troubled, I guess, by um, Difficulties, some problems that we could have when we arrive here anyway. The second one is uh, our mentoring programs. We have two of them that are being developed as we speak. One of them is being led by, the, uh, by a New York team again, and is the, the one that Christina mentioned before, is Fostering Dogs. This is a mentoring team for all of those professionals that are in the training phase or at the end of the training phase in their careers, and we like to get a job as a professional. This, this is what this mentorship program will help you do. Um, before I uh, finish with, uh, with my speech, I would like to tell you what are the goals from Boston for this next year that is incoming. The first one is to consolidate and enhance all of the activities that you have heard that we have done already. In addition to this, we would like also to increase the number of full members and also associate members in ECUSA. And last but not least, we would like to strengthen the links between Spain and the USA by promoting webinars and collaborations with Spanish institutions and universities. I would like all of these, actually, all of these programs that we bring at the national level and also at the local level would not be possible without the uh, contribution from our, from our national series sponsors. The Fundación Ramón de Areces, la Federación de Ciencia y Tecnología, FECIT, and PICOLO. In addition, we also have sponsors and collaborators at the local level that are helping with our, with our events. I would like to thank you, like uh, Cristina has done before, for you to come in to celebrate our first anniversary of ECUSA Boston. And we'd like to ask you, if you would like to volunteer with us and be part of the organization, please contact us. Also, if you have ideas about programs or events that you would like to see, please also contact us and let, let us know. I would like to, again, encourage you to, be a, to become a full member of ECUSA to uh, be able to have all of the uh, uh, access to events for free and to participate in the mentoring programs and other programs that we are developing only for full members. And uh, before I, before I, um, we, uh, I let um, Jose Ignacio Fernández Vera, the president of the FECID, give us a few words, I would like to remind you of what Cristina's mother said. There is no, there is no excuse not to be in ECUSA. No hay excusa para no ser de ECUSA. So please come join us at whichever level, at whichever level you want, either with, uh, with our team, associate or full member. Please do join us. Buenas tardes a todos. Me ha resultado imposible asistir a este primer aniversario de CUSA en Boston, pero no quería dejar de deciros unas palabras. Para mí es un orgullo todo el camino recorrido por la Asociación de Investigadores Españoles en Estados Unidos. En noviembre del año pasado, cuando inauguraba el capítulo de la Asociación, me dirigí por primera vez a todos vosotros. Aproveché entonces para presentaros la actividad que desarrolla nuestra Fundación, la Fundación Española para la Ciencia y la Tecnología, y que puede resumirse en una sola frase. 
trabajamos para que en España el ciudadano se interese y participe cada vez más en la ciencia. Esa ciencia en la que vosotros tenéis un papel relevante. Y por eso queremos que seáis referente para todos nuestros jóvenes y que no perdáis el contacto con nuestro sistema. Permitidme repetir las palabras que Su Majestad el Rey Felipe VI pronunció en el reciente encuentro de científicos españoles en Washington. Vosotros, los investigadores, sois excelentes embajadores del talento y de la innovación española. Y por eso hoy, quiero de nuevo animaros a seguir vuestro camino de éxitos y a seguir trabajando por ello. Muchas gracias. And now, it is an honor for me to introduce our speaker of today, Mercedes Balsals. She embodies the spirit of ECUSA mission and vision. Mercedes is a scientist at the, at the MIT Institute for Medical Engineering and Science and co-director of MIT Spain. She earned her PhD in macromolecular chemistry from RWTH and her university in Germany. Thereafter, at MIT, Mercedes pursued biochemical engineering research at the Harvard MIT Biochemical Engineering Center, co-created the MIT Spain program and founded Regineer, a company that seeks to develop tissue engineered cartilage to repair genetic facial abnormalities or accidental injuries. We look forward to hearing from Merce about her research, entrepreneurial activities, and her work establishing international exchange programs between Spain and the US. Merce. So thank you very much, Isabel, Cristina, Ecusa, everybody, for being here today. Uh, it's a pleasure for me. I have changed the title of my slide because that from road to success, from Boston to Spain road to success, it seemed too big of a title for me. I just want here to say happy birthday, Ecusa. Uh, what you have done this year has a tremendous, it's very important. Uh, I wish I would have had Ecusa 15 years ago when I arrived. So let me shortly tell you three stories um, in this half an hour that I hope I can explain you bef between my talk and some nice Spanish food. Uh, so if I got the job correctly, I was supposed to explain you how from studying mechanotransduction in blood vessels, you can help develop medical, medical devices, how from studying mechanotransduction in blood cells, and I will tell you what it is that in a little bit. Can you create a startup, Regineer? Uh, also, how from hosting one or two Spanish students, uh, MIT's program, MIT Spain program was developed. So basically, my job today in 30 minutes is give you the, the chemical formula to promote collaboration between industry and academia to create startup, to create what I call as academic startup. And so basically, do what I do, what is my passion, why, how, from doing research, to expand the knowledge we, we have about things that affect the lives and disease, and promoting education, teaching the new leaders in science and technology, we can have big impact in innovation and interna internationalization. So this is my job today, and I hope I can explain you these three stories as quick as possible. And, and Normally I start from the beginning, but I want to start by the end because the last slide is the one that every, nobody reads anymore and everybody's thinking, oh, I'm getting hungry. So I'm going to start how this is possible. And it's 15 years here. This is possible because my family, my beloved family, my husband, Jeff, raise your hand. Here, my daughter Isabel, raise your hand. <laughs> my daughter Sofia, raise your hand. And obviously, my uh, family in Boston, Patricia, my mother in law, and Becky, my sister in law, my brother in law, Roberto, and my wonderful nieces and nephews who are here today. But also, my family in Spain. I'm the oldest of six, so as you can see, we produce a lot of people. I needed a lot of people at home to support what I'm going to tell you. I hope, I'm very happy they are here today, some of them, because they are going to see what their mom or sister-in-law or spouse is doing while well, they are helping me. You know, by the age of five years old, Isabel and Sofia had crossed the Atlantic 50 times, 5-0. Uh, 
Um, I also want, this is the slide, another slide is very important. What I'm going to tell you today, uh, it's impossible. I haven't done it by myself. I have extraordinary collaborators. Uh, you, I have listed, I hope I didn't forget anybody, um, but you can see all my you know, collaborators in the lab. Here in Spain, you will see some pattern there. This is uh, all what I'm going to tell you today. It has some common denominator. It has Spain and it has Boston. <laughs> and all the students I have been hosting over the years here at MIT that they go back and forth between Spain and, and MIT. And of course, all the funding, all the research projects we have been funding, uh, companies that have supported, philanthropies that have supported me and my projects. Uh, that I wanted to make sure I, I thank before everybody, you know, gets distracted on, on what comes next. But nothing would have been possible without that. So mechanotransduction. This is my field. It sounds very uh, difficult and kind of long, long, long word. It means environment matters. It means how cells in the body can convert physical forces that they sense in their environment. How can they translate them and turn into a biological response? So basically. This is a good example. My students, when it's 8 o'clock in the morning and I'm teaching, sometimes they, they look like that. They are night owls. When we go outing, like we went some years ago and we did whitewater rafting, their, their way of behaving was totally different. And I know because I was there, I don't get to do it so much. Uh, when they are night clapping and having fun, you know, they are completely different. Well, so environment matters. The same happened with the sensor in our body. So this is three pictures in obtaining my lab where you can see this pentagonal, you know, cobblestone morphology of cells, endothelial cells that line our blood vessels. When they are under static conditions with no flow, just stop, they look like this. They look like a cobblestone, like an old European city. If you expose them to flow, they start aligning and modifying their structure to align along the, the, the direction of the flow. And when you start giving some turbulent flow, they lose this orientation and even be, 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 start to detach. So this picture kind of tells you uh, something is going on. So that is my field of research. I am very interested. And um, to, to study cells in flows and mechanical forces, we were forced to develop some kind of models. You know, some models because it's not easy to grow cells on plates. Some scientists here may know. It's not easy to have models that are relevant, you know, to understand Wait, sorry. Okay. To understand what's going on with disease, how can we diagnose it, how can we treat it better? So when we, I went back to my collaborators uh, in the hospital, and they were nice enough to give me some angiograms from patients with car uh, coronary disease, and with that we develop a computational platform to model these vessels, uh, simple with many geometry parameters described, easy, to create some models that look like arteries. This is the case of a, a coronary artery, even in the shape and the curvature that uh, uh, the heart provides. With these models, then we can ask questions about how the cells in the body interact with their fluidic environment. <laughs> so with these models, we take the silicon mock and other materials, and what we do is we coat them with proteins uh, so that we can layer by layer assemble the different cell components that build arteries. First, we lay fibroblasts, then we lay smooth muscle cells, then we seed endothelial cells. So you end up with something that I wanted at the beginning to call an artificial artery or vein, uh, but uh, my colleagues in the clinic would say we should be more humble and say this is something that resembles an artery. So let's call it a vessel-like construct. And we went on and on and to try to convince the, the, the medical professionals that what we have, these models, with the cells in it, really fulfill a lot of the requirements that an artery or a vein will have. That the cells are in the right order, that the cells dilate, contract, get inflamed under different conditions that we can control in the lab. Because in the lab we can isolate one variable versus having the whole body experience. So we get something that looks like arteries or veins. Um, I'm sorry, keep doing. Um, we connect it, you know, it wouldn't be uh, realistically, physiologically relevant if those tubes seeded with cells will not be exposed to flow. So we have developed a bioreactor to expose those cells to flow relevant conditions. And then we start studying these cells. We look at cell markers and molecular markers of disease. 
And we are able to look at things like oxidized low density lipoprotein, tissue factor, a coagulation of protein, monosite addition, inflammatory cells attaching to these models. And here on the y axis, uh, x, x axis, you see different, different arteries, like the, this is the, mm, the internal carotid artery, external carotid artery, and the central carotid before the bifurcation. And you can see that there is a pretty good correlation with the recirculation level. So those areas, let's imagine you are in a river and there is some areas of recirculation and flow stagnation are those that show more cholesterol deposition, more tissue factors of more clotting, more monocyte addition. And here is a picture of how the experiments look like. They are not so bloody as other things I have seen in the, in the surgery room. But basically suggesting that in the way, in the areas where there is flow stagnation, things Go, go, not, don't go so well. So most of you will be now saying, so what? Who cares about mechanotransduction and flow stagnation? Well, I am a scientist like many in the room, so it's important because we are doing that to increase the knowledge we have, and that brings patents, that brings publications, that brings funding for continuing doing our work and understanding at the molecular and cellular level what is going on in our blood vessels. But also, in my, in, during these 15 years, it has helped to establish collaborations with industry, you know, with medical device, instrumentation, and pharma, pharma companies. And let me give you an example of many of those collaborations um, and why it's important in kind of transduction. Well, the real problem is that cardiovascular disease kills more people than cancer. And this is what happens. This is an angiogram of a person, and you have here the, the gray area is your artery, and here suddenly it seems like it disappears. It doesn't disappear, it's 90% occlusion. So this person is not doing very good. If this artery is one of the ones that is wrapping around your heart, uh, this person is going to have very quick uh, a problem, a heart attack. Um, there is a multi-billion industry developing stents. Stents are a small uh, metal, uh, metal and other materials, but the first ones were metal um, devices that are used to reopen that artery. So basically, this is the before stenting, and this is after stenting. So here you see the narrowing, and after the stent is deployed inside the artery, it kind of pushes you know, the plaque out and reopens. So the flow is, the, the flow is restored, and that without having to go uh, under you know, open heart surgery. So it's very important. So one of the applications of my research that I didn't know a priori is uh, stent companies coming to us and saying, can you help us Guide, guide or design, or new stents. Stents are good, but can we make them better? And for example, this is an example of stent A or stent B. Um, this is one of our models, so it's one of the ones I have shown you. Plastic model, laid with cells. The white dots are cells. These are the stent struts, the metal rods that build the stent. And as you can see, in this area, you see there is a lot you know, of no cells there. So this stent is doing worse, is denuding the endothelial cells, while this is only doing a little bit of injury here. Now, another important parameter when you deploy stents, and my good colleague and friend, Dr. Colin Daivello, in the audience knows very well, thank you, <laughs> is uh, the pressure you deploy the stent, because if you deploy it with a lot of pressure, you, do, you can do a lot of damage, you know? If you deploy it with little pressure, then the stent is not fully opposed in the vessel, and then it can trigger coagulation. So basically, it's very important to know what is the right pressure, and there is a good balance and a, and a compromise between becoming very thrombotic, because it's not well opposed, or becoming you know, too opposed that you have the needle all the endothelium. So this is one of the applications of, uh, I found, uh, or they found me, uh, of the STEM industry, to guide device design. Device design. The other will be not only designing, but once they have designed these devices, the normal path is to go and put them in a model that is similar to human. And for cardiovascular research, this is a peak. Yeah, peak is the, the heart of the peak looks much more like us. Uh, but those studies in peaks are very expensive and long. So what we can do with our model is really deploying stents in our in our system under flow and look at areas of arterial flow, healthy flow, no recirculation or areas where the, the flow is oscillatory and there is a stagnation. And we can count cells, you know, my students are very good in the microscope getting all awesome images to quantify. We can look at how many cells are in the stem, and not only how many cells, 
we have we can calculate how many of each cell type because as i told you in every blood vessel there are three cell types and the most close to the flow are endothelial cells and then smooth muscle cells so it's important to know who is first who is exposed to blood and and we can do that in these models and we can look even deeper inside the cells and look at molecules that are expressed that if they are overexpressed they can provoke coagulation so basically this is a photo again uh, of what our device in collaboration with Dr. Fernando Velo can show that areas where the flow is stagnant, uh, these devices do worse. You know, you have more smooth muscle cells exposed. They activate the uh, tissue, the coagulation cascade by by expressing more uh, tissue factor. And the, at the end, you know, the same stent placed in the wrong place can have a picture like that: clot versus not clot. So that has been very, you know, a uh, very interesting way to, from mechanotransduction to really helping uh, predict the outcome of these devices that uh, help so many people. So this is my first story. How's my timing? About 10 minutes per story. So my first story, I hope, you know, to, that I have been able to show you how mechanotransduction is my passion, but how it helps, you know, create this industry academic collaboration where the company, you know, sees a benefit. We are helping them design and evaluate um, Set, uh, devices. I tell you about the stents that we have done with sensors, mm -hmm. and all that. Uh, but also, they help us by, you know, uh, supporting our basic research. My second story tonight is how, you know, what, how mechanotransduction. And I was very happy doing mechanotransduction since '99. How I got into creating a startup. Um, well, this is the story. The starting point is 2004. It starts from a a, a very difficult day. I found out my best friend from college, Andrea, Agatha, had a, a baby girl. My, her baby girl was born only three days before my daughter. So imagine, we were not, we didn't make an agreement to have the same baby at the same time, you know, the baby at the same time, but it just happened. And Andrea was born with, um, with a condition called microtia. Microtia means a small ear. So here you have a photo of uh, uh, Andrea when she was months old. And that was, I tell you, one of the hard days of my life, you know, when I have been away from home and working on mechanotransduction, trying to do blood vessels, artificial blood vessels, you know, working with tissue engineering, and now I have this phone call of this problem. But um, I learned that from problems, good things can happen. So what happened next is that we found out that there were only two solutions. The main solutions today yet are uh, when, when you have a child with this condition are two main approaches. One is a silicone rubber ear like this, you know, like they use for even for the movie industry, you know, to put ears. It attaches directly through the, to the skull by means of a wire and some nails directly to the skull. And it needs to be removed every night. So it's like, it's hard enough to tell children to brush their teeth. Can you imagine, tell them to brush, remove the ear, brush it, and then it looks like Horrible, you know, it's very weird, alien looking, you know, because you have wire, a wire that sits on your skull coming out. The second solution that is also the most common actually is uh, rib based reconstruction. That means that uh, amazing surgeons are able to remove three, four, or five ribs from the chest cavity of the children, and out of the rib cartilage, they cut something that looks like an ear. So this is rib cartilage bended and suture and made in the shape of an ear and then they reimplant the ear. So you can see this is, the result is good, the ears look very realistic, but it has taken several surgeries, surgeries very invasive. I must, I must acknowledge that um, the first time I, I went to the surgery room to see this procedure, I fainted. So I went in to see and when I saw it, I was out, you know, wheel out. <laughs> very embarrassing for me, but it happened. So, but at that time, back in 2004, I told Agatha, don't worry, we have the father of this engineering, Dr. Vacanti, working uh, in the Brigham and Women's Hospital, working and progressing towards cartilage regeneration for ear implants. And this is a picture that actually appeared in CNN, right around that year. So I said, don't worry, there is going to be ears, you know, out of the shell that you could be able to treat your daughter with. But time went by, four years, you know, we were not in a hurry. That we thought Dr. Bacanti was doing the ears, and, and, and nothing came. And then here you see Agatha. Agatha works in Denon for the Spanish people. Uh, Dana Cole is her other baby, so she's the the the, the mind and the, the scientist and the marketing uh, specialist um, uh, behind the Dana Cole viewer. Uh, Agatha and her husband Albert became impatient and said, "Okay, 
science is going, we believe and we trust you scientists, but something is missing because we're having waiting for years and nothing is coming out. So they, they convinced me and I convinced my mentor and colleague, Professor Edelman here, and together with also Dr. Parry, who is the Children's Hospital in Barcelona, San Juan de Deu Hospital, is uh, Andrea's uh, doctor and the, the, one of the only accredited surgeons to do the surgery as it is now with the rib reconstruction, we team up and said, we had a dream, you know, and the dream back in 2009 was like, can we push science forward, accelerate it to make facial cartilage regeneration a reality that benefits not only Andrea, but a lot of people. Uh, that have had, you know, not only ear malformation, but also trauma uh, or, or, or have had problems due to disease, you know, like cancer. And we wanted to do that in the shortest time period and, of course, in the most safe way. Um, the first problem there was not the science, you know, the science was solid. The, per the first problem we encountered was to make the market larger because, thank goodness, microtia, it's a rare disease. Only one in every 6,000 uh, births um, of children are born with a little ear, so that's a good thing. But it's not a good thing if you want to have funding and seek investors to do a, a viable company. So if, you know, I reach out to Agatha Albert and also our partners in Catanion who were like, we need to do a business plan and this is no business. So this is no business, we cannot do ears for children. Uh, so the first challenge was to, to make larger the platform larger and come from doing ears to doing can we do a platform for three-dimensional cartilage regeneration? Can we do something that can help, for example, uh, uh, that is applicable to rhinoplasties? And the rhinoplasties there, the, the figure is, is changing. Like only in the US, there are just 2009, and this date is obsolete because that's where they, we were already starting, but about 700,000 rhinoplasties in the US. However, on the US and in Europe, only 10% of those rhinoplasties need cartilage. Most of women, mostly women, that undergo rhinoplasty, they don't want a larger nose, they want a smaller nose. But we identified that in Asia, there is what the so-called Asian rhinoplasty, where, you know, a graft of cartilage is needed. So that's one application. And also, it, we found others in split lip. And, and then, when you talk about a platform for regeneration, Obviously, the big market and that makes this company work or will make it work is we are able to apply it to hip replacement, to delay hip replacement, to delay knee replacement, and then eventually treat it. You know, but only only by delaying it, you know, that will be already great. So how how we did that? Uh, the goal was to go from great science, you know, uh, at lab scale, to make something that could be cost effective and in a standard way to obtain tissue quality for implantation. And uh, so that from a patient specific, so we will have a patient, we will wrap a biopsy, and from that biopsy, we could expand the cells, monitor their expansion, characterize them thoroughly in a standard way, and also minimizing the, the hurdles of regulatory. Uh, for example, I when I am in the lab and I put my hat of a scientist, I use growth factors, I use hormones, I use a lot of things. You know, I lose tons of very expensive antibodies to characterize the goal and what it brought me to the lab when I put my hat of regeneer is to make it as cheap as possible, as simple as possible, no growth factors. So every time I talk to, uh, to my students that work on this project, they say, can I use this? No. Can I use that? No. Can you do this? No. Nothing. The minimum amount of things to make it cost effective, but also that has a lower uh, difficulty to pass the, regula the regulatory agencies in a safe way. So during 2013 and 2014, what we did is we signed a sponsor research agreement. Uh, that's a collaboration with the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, here you have Dr. Bacanti, Dr. Kojima, Dr. Westerman, uh, who were the experts that I said about cartilage. I came from tissue engineering, but I always said I did blood vessels, I did soft tissue, no hard tissue. So I joined their team. I was able to work with them. I was able to, to, to learn about these nude mice. Uh, I, I was told in, in the US there are two types of mice, Mickey Mouse and the Vacanti Mouse. So I, was, I have seen both now, so I'm very happy. But this is the, the, the Vacanti Mouse. Um, so we, I was really getting hands-on uh, from the, the experts in the field. Uh, for me, it was experience that I have always been the research, not the company, and now here I was the company, and they were doing the research. So it was also seeing the world from the other side, which was very interesting for me. 
Um, this is just some example of what the research looks like. We tested different cell types. Uh, here when you see 100 to 0, that means all chondrocytes obtained from a biopsy. And when you see 0 to 100, it's all mesenchymal stem cells from the bone marrow. So we were thinking, where can we get cells from a potential person or patient? So we use bone marrow cells, we use cartilage cells, and we did combinations of them to look at how the tissue evolved. And as you see here, when there are only mesenchymal cells, the, the, the tiny, tiny, tiny tissue, we obtain tiny tissue. So chondrocytes are necessary. It mixed with mesenchymal stem cells, they do as good as an additional cell source because keep in mind that our first objective is children with no ear and they only have one and it's a healthy one. So ideally, we don't want to remove one ear to do the other. So we're looking for other cell sources, which is interesting. Um, we also test different materials. And again, that was a limitation. We, I am a chemist and my first inclination was let's synthesize a new cool material that will solve all problems. And the, from my company perspective, was like we have a number of materials that are approved for implantation in humans already by the FDA, by the, uh, by the EMA, uh, the European Medical uh, Drug a a Agency. So let's just grab this library of materials that are already existing and move up, build from there. Don't start from zero. Uh, with that, uh, we, after doing the experiments in small mice, nude mice, these mice have been have no immune system. So basically, you can put whatever you want in them, and they will not die, and they will not chew away whatever you're putting. But at least you, you can prove that your implant done with other cells, with human cells, or with uh, rabbit cells works. But the most important question we did uh, just last year was, for the first time, create an animal model. That's already a bigger model. It's in rabbits. As you see in the chicks plant, rabbits. <laughs> uh, which basically mimic what we want to do with children and with adults uh, later on, that is taking a small biopsy, the smallest possible, uh, extracting the cells, expanding them in vitro. So you see here, you know, the size of the biopsies. And this is my hand, so you can see small biopsy, six millimeters in diameter. Expand them in, in, in vitro, grow them in this scaffold material so that the cells can attach and grow, implant them in the same animal that donated the cells. So it's an autotransplant and then see how the material uh, is looking after one or two months. And this is too beautiful. This is, for me, were beautiful. I even my students took a picture of me smiling. Um, two beautiful uh, pieces of cartilage that we were able to, you know, to explain uh, with uh, the appropriate uh, amount of glycosaminoglycan, collagen one, collagen two. Mechanically, they are still not there to be implantable, so they need to be a little bit stiffer. But that was for us like the first big you know, breakthrough moment where we said, wow, we can take a small amount of tissue and, and turn it into something. That is, this is one centimeter. So it's like four times three centimeter and with a thickness of half. So coming from this small biopsy. Uh, now we are in phase three, which we are preparing for next year, do our first uh, clinical trial. We are doing all the paperwork necessary for having an, an approval by the regulatory agencies. Uh, we are working with uh, San Juan de Deu Hospital in Barcelona, and we are hoping that they give us the okay to do this. In it's going to be a 18-year-old pediatric patient that volunteers to be the first one to try to remove a biopsy from his, and we will expand it and it will be reimplanted. It will not be in the ear shape; it will be, you know, just a concrete shape and probably not in the face behind the neck, you know, because we don't want we want to be really, really safe. But uh, we're very excited. I'm very excited that this is going to go into patients next year. Um, we have been, busy, you know, Agatha is a tremendous person. You know, she wants to help. She's a mom. She's, and we are a company, but we actually started because we wanted to help children. So the social impact she has created and organized two meetings already every year in the in, in San Juan de Deu. Seventy families came. Um, I I I didn't mention that. Uh, the, the occurrence of microtia is one to six thousand in Caucasian, but but it's much higher, one to four thousand in Latin American um, race. So we had people flying from Colombia, from Bolivia, from places all to Barcelona with their children. So here you see all the children with microtia for these meetings, and not only that, they they we find out that the microtia, all the information about microtia was in English. And a lot of people with children with microtia do not speak English. So we created the microtia.es 
a page with the help of uh, San Juan de Deu doctor. So that's not a mere translation of documents. No, this is with the help of scientists and doctors, making sure that the information in the page is right. And when I say doctors, it's not only the surgeon, but the psychologist. The, the, you know, there is a very important psychological uh, aspect of children with microtia. Um, so we developed the, the web page. Uh, it says Regineer because Regineer sponsored it, but uh, it's a Spanish web page, and we are proud that when you click Microsha, it's after Wikipedia, it's the, it's the page that comes first. So I think people are really using that as a resource, Spanish-speaking people. Um, so that's my second story. And the third, uh, last but not least, is like how, from hosting one or two students, uh, how I was... How I started or I co-founded uh, with the help again of many people the MIT Spain program. So um, there were exchanges, early exchanges of my institute, Institute Chimic de Sarria is where I graduated from, and there were exchanges between Professor Henri Julia, who was the director uh, of the of the institute, and Professor Charles Cooney, who was uh, the chief of the department of chemical engineering at MIT. Back in the in '95, at that time I was in Germany, but they already say did like a lot of Spanish. Uh, universities are doing like uh, students that come in a you know the student finds a good way you know a good project and they come because same thing happened they were early scattered like one two students that came I joined uh, the Edelman lab in, in 99 and I was asked oh as an alum if I was would you like to have one student to come and do your master thesis with you and I thought wow uh, of course I can practice my Spanish sometimes my Catalan and also, that would be amazing. I wish I would have had that opportunity when I was doing my master. So I said yes, immediately. And since 2001, I have been you know, receiving students. Uh, I counted uh, just for the talk, and since then, I have hosted 98 students from IQS. Five have become PhDs from, I, from MIT. Like they decided to apply for grad school, and they did their PhDs here. Uh, and there is ongoing collaborations with about 10 professors there, 10 professors here with projects, <laughs> research projects and publications together. So mm, Dr. Julia came every year to see the students, to see me, to see the MIT faculty who hosted them. And, and one day, he, one of these visits, uh, I decided to gather all together in one room and MIT faculty said, oh, we are very happy with the students, but we have some, you know, we are some. We have some ideas. So, and I was like, oh, if they have some comments, that's not good. And they said, well, the, the, this exchange is unidirectional. It's only from Barcelona to Boston, and maybe MIT students would like to have this experience, no, of doing research abroad. Uh, it's limited to people. We know you, you know, so it's a personal relationship. Uh, so, can it be something more than you being here and you know helping students come? And also, it's limited to chemistry because I well, I work with Institute Chimica de Sarria, as the name said, in chemical engineering and chemistry. So, can it be broader? Can it be what about great biologists, great engineers? You know, can it be? So I said, well, I I would look, I would look and find what is in there. It must it must exist something? And and yeah, it exists. It existed. MIT had a, a program that is called MISTI, MIT International Science and Technology Initiatives. And they have programs with Germany, with Japan, uh, with France. There was no MIT Spain. So I approached the director of uh, MIT, uh, one of the directors of one of the successful programs, which was Germany. And I approached him and I asked, why is there not an MIT Spain? And they said, well, very simple. Well, he told me a couple of things you don't want to hear. Like, oh, oh. you know, España es fiesta y siesta. And uh, companies close, <laughs> companies in Spain close all the summer. So. But that I disregard, I smiled and said, I wait for telling me things I could uh, say constructive. And he said, we need to, uh, I needed to do a business plan. And I'm like, oh. Basically, find a product, and the product was talent. I wanted to promote talent exchange. Find a market, meaning a network. You know, is there a need? Is there MIT students and faculty will be welcome and will be able to work in Spain? And Spanish collaborators, will they like to engage with MIT? Find out. I, I needed a, a team. I reached out to a couple of uh, MIT faculty, uh, Dr. Professor Jaume Pereire, uh, Mar uh, Professor Martinez, um, and you know, and we kind of built a team. Uh, the language requirement also very important for an MIT program. Uh, th there had to be Spanish taught because they said it's not enough to go and do science in Spain. 
They wanted the whole experience. They wanted that the students understood the culture and really embedded into the Spanish uh, system. So having a Spanish taught at MIT, and MIT there is the, the most known and larger at the School of Engineering and Science, but there is a very important humanities school, and they taught Spanish, that was key. If not, I would have been in trouble. And then, no money, no mission. I had to raise, uh, uh, just to start, $250,000, you know, to make sure that the program could be launched. And, and that was done. You know, I, I was amazed to find the support from the Barcelona Chamber of Commerce, from ESEX, from my, even my university, IQS, small companies like Posimac, big companies like Acciona, and many others I have not put in between. But basically, universities, companies, government, local government, Promo Madrid doesn't exist anymore, help us too. And just more recently, uh, the University Politécnica de Madrid, Universidad de Alcalá, and the Fundación Catalunya La Pedrera. These were key to convince MIT that uh, MIT Forum was launched in 2006. Forum meaning a tri phase. See, if we could engage into some kind of meaningful collaboration and nobody would be killed in San Fermines. Because I was very, very, very afraid. I sent two students and both went to San Fermines. And I'm like, oh no, this, are, this is the end of my program. San Fermin, where is the end of it? It didn't happen, they did very good. And now, you know, with the help of Alicia, which is, who is the program director, Alicia, <laughs> I couldn't have done it without her. Uh, the official MIT Spain program was launched in 2007. We have uh, enabled uh, exchanges with Spain of more than 500 students. It doesn't seem a big number, but remember, in MIT, we only have 4,000 undergraduate students. So, uh, you know, in, maybe in Spanish universities will be like tiny, but this is very significant. MIT is one of the la MIT Spain is one of the largest programs now in this thing. Uh, we have uh, been able to en engage in, in promote also collaborations with uh, with, uh, with between academy, uh, with faculty. So Spanish professors have engaged into collaborative projects with uh, MIT faculty, and we have developed more than 200 uh, partnerships. And just to give you some examples, you know, uh, of the things we have done is, uh, for example, just last January, uh, we sent some MIT students to high schools in Spain, uh, concretely in Barcelona, because La Pedrera Foundation supported us and said, we want that students to go to Barcelona school areas and the amount of funding was limited. So we were able to send, Alicia, correct me if I'm wrong, six students, yes? But we had 90 applicants. So 90 MIT students wanted to go to high schools in Spain just to inspire and to talk in English, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, here you have an example that uh, Alicia put this slide for me of Natalie, who taught high school, you know, across the technology and science field. And um, it was a great experience for the MIT student, turning now into a teacher, but uh, the impact of this short but intensive uh, stays for the uh, Spanish students who were, you know, in high school, seeing this this person that doesn't look much older than them, talking them, uh, talking to them about science and technology was really tremendous. And this year we hope to be sending more. Another example of things we do: internships. MIT students go to do internships in companies, big and small. For example, here you have Brian, who went to this small company called TapTap Networks, and he's a student from mechanical, uh, from uh, computer science. The program is open to all students, all fields of study in MIT. So you will see mechanical engineering, computer science, biologists. And he, you know, was there and contributed, basically applying all the knowledge and experience he has got here. Now you apply it in a small company in Spain or in a big company like La Casa. You know, developing um, um, a functionality for online banking for La Caixa. La Caixa is one of the uh, innovative uh, banks in Spain that was part of hosting one of these student internships. Um, we also support internships, academic internships. So that's why also we are also fundraising actively to support uh, research internships. So that the Spanish students such as Melissa went to Indea Energy in Madrid to develop uh, to upgrade bio oils via hydro oxygenation reactions. And again, she said, this is, you know, I, I love, you know, as a Spanish, I'm very proud when somebody who is not a Spanish goes and says things about Spain like that, you know, that was a wonderful place to explore a future career in energy research because of long-standing long commitment to sustainable energy and climate, in combating climate change. So that's very nice things to hear. It's very nice th things to hear about the Spanish people interacting with the MIT students. 
as part of a very rewarding uh, work. Uh, we launched a MIT Spain seed fund. It's just money put together for enabling travel between MIT faculty and students, and Spanish faculty and students. This is truly, truly bidirectional. So this is just an example of uh, my colleague and good friend, Dr. Uh, Professor Pablo Jarillo, who got one of this funding, and this had a small funding, eh? $15,000, $20,000, that ex enables them to travel back and forth. And you would say, if I'm a faculty here, how can I start collaborating with a professor in Valencia? And it's not so easy. It's not so easy because there is no funds that support something so silly like the international travel. If they have funds with Europe, they can travel in Europe. If we have funds with NIH and SF, we can travel here. And to put us together and travel with the students and be there for a week, a week or a month, it, it doesn't exist. So that 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 seed fund fell a gap that was very important. And I say fell because unfortunately we lost. We, that this whole initiative was supported by the Barcelona Chamber of Commerce, and with economic crisis and changes, we lost that. You know, the chamber is not able to support that. Even if this collaboration enabled um, this uh, seed fund enabled collaboration with all the universities in Spain, which I thought it was really. Uh, like for example, this one of uh, Yuri Roman at MIT collaborating with uh, um, the, the research center in Tarragona and the technical technology in Valencia. So that's the end. I don't want to stand be behind, you know, between you and nice Spanish food. But what I wanted to finish up wrapping up these stories, these stories, and what I have learned during these 15 years are that always follow your dreams. You will hear a lot of no's, a lot of impossibles, and a lot of crazy comments. Always follow them uh, with passion, with a broad view, and with an excellent team. I have been blessed to always be surrounded by my best team at home and at work. Um, hard work and proactivity always pays off. You wish sometimes that it will pay off a little earlier, you know, not to be like, ah, but it always pays off. Uh, so continue working hard. And then, that the difference between basic research, you know, and the different and um, applied research is not so clear to me. I, I don't see why mechanotransduction is basic and designing devices is applied. It's just that, you know, it's it's difficult. I, I don't like when people decide, oh, you, I, you are a basic scientist, you are an applied scientist. I think uh, somebody will explain me what is the difference. The borders between science and applied and basic are very blurred to me. And and that's it. There is a reception and. The room next door. Uh, I have questions. If you have any question, I am happy to answer. Uh, if you want to have them later, I can also. So, any question, any comments? Any questions everybody wants to ask? Yeah. <laughs>